This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. It is Climate Countdown. We're live in Copenhagen at the Bella Center, the only global daily news hour broadcasting on television, radio and the Internet uh, from right here at the Climate Talks at COP15, the Conference of Parties. Our two guests right now are Naomi Klein. She's blogging for The Nation magazine, um, and she is author of The Shock Doctrine and No Logo. Martin Kors is with us as well. He's executive director of the South Center. He's based in Geneva, comes from Malaysia. And then we'll be joined by the chief climate negotiators from two Latin American countries, from Paraguay and Bolivia. I'm Amy Goodman with Anjali Comet. Anjali? Martin, can you talk about some of the numbers in the Danish text, the text produced by the Circle of Commitment? They talk about $10 billion um, to be invested in this. $10 billion uh, for developing countries to take all these actions to prevent climate change and to, to tackle the effects of climate change is, is too minuscule. You know, the United Nations recently— uh, That's has $10 billion a year. $10 billion a year. But the, the UN estimated that we require at least five to $600 billion a year, and a new study in London shows that you need at least $500 billion a year. In fact, uh, in my estimation, we need at least 2 percent of the GNP of the, of the rich countries, uh, and that's about $800 billion a year. What does it pay for? You see, you have to allow the developing countries to continue their economic growth and at the same time to reduce their emissions. The only way in which they can do this is if we have massive transfers of finance and technology. You know, not for luxuries, but simply to get food production and housing and, uh, you know, to, to, to build the seawalls and so on. If, if this uh, amount of money does not come, then the developing countries are, are sunk or fried by, by, by climate change. And they won't be able to take their own actions in terms of changing their technology in transportation, in energy, in industry and so on. I think one of the things that's so important about this is that everybody ha we all have a vested interest in this. It's not—first of all, it's not charity. It, it, it is based on the principle that the polluter pays, that the rich world created the climate crisis. Um, so it isn't a handout. But in addition to it not being a handout, as Martin says, um, Everybody in the world has an interest in helping the developing world to leapfrog over uh, fossil fuels uh, and uh, develop using cleaner but more expensive technologies, more expensive upfront, because the technologies are expensive at the start. Eventually, they actually become cheaper than fossil fuels. But there is a heavy upfront cost, and that's what these numbers would be covering, in part. And can you talk a little bit about the issues around the transfer of technology and how it ties into trade agreements and intellectual property rights? Well, the thing is that technology will be required if we are to change from, you know, the old patterns of energy in developing countries, and that causes trillions of dollars of, 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 of cash, you know, and then all the machines in the industries, all the motor cars that are outmoded and so on, they have to be totally refitted and, and rechanged. But for us to be able to obtain the technology to do this, it has to be at the cheapest possible cost, because each dollar of technology that we have must be able to do five times uh, the work, uh, because it's five times cheaper. And so we come to this issue of intellectual property rights. When intellectual property rights attach to a technology, becomes a barrier to its transfer, because it increases the cost and it prevents developing countries from making the same technologies, then we have to overcome this barrier in order to have the greater international global good. And this is one of the issues being discussed here. Uh, unfortunately, the developed countries seem to want to maintain their total control over intellectual property, which means technological dominance over such a crucial area as climate change. But the talks are still going on, uh, and we hope that uh, the United States in particular will relax their very rigid stand that uh, we will have business as usual on intellectual property, whilst we ask you not to have business as usual in terms of your pattern of development. I want to ask a question about, um, well, for example, very powerful statement of the representative of the Group of 77 in China, Stanislav uh, um, uh, Lumumba Stanislav Diaping of Sudan. Um, 
The representatives here, for example, of Sudan, I mean, will be discredited by many right away, saying, who is he to? I mean, it was a powerful statement about imperialism, that this is a disgrace, that this sec secret Danish text is actually um, dangerous right now, that it's a new Bretton Woods. I think the outrage really is that we were told all along there's no such text, there's no plan B. We, we, are not, we, we are not having a small group of people cooking up something. So when it is revealed by a newspaper that by indeed the Guardian, there is right? a plan B, you know, and that a few people have been looking at it, then those who are excluded feel very uh, discouraged because this is the United Nations. It's a very democratic forum. People put forward their proposals. We fight and quarrel, but at the end of the day, we reach an agreement. So I think the feeling is that uh, there should not have been an exclusive group. Right. And if there is a plan to come out with a short version of a declaration, then each region should have been asked to, rep to, to have a representative and that we, we trash it out together. But that issue of the human rights abusers being the spokespeople, like the country of Sudan. Well, Sudan uh, does not speak for itself in terms of the Group of 77. It is there to represent the entire group. This is a, a, an association of developing countries. And what he says uh, is to represent the feelings of uh, the 130 countries of the Group of 77. So he has that mandate to, to represent the views of these countries. It is not his personal view. I think it, it is really important, though, Amy, that you raise it, because we have to understand that this is part of a pattern, that whenever things happen at the U.N. that the U.S. and other powerful players don't like, the strategy in order to discredit the policies, no matter how many developing countries back it, is to single out a couple of of governments with well-earned bad reputations and say, well, we don't need to be—if we think about the Durban II conference, for instance, the Durban Review Conference, what was the line? It was, we don't want to hear about racism from Libya and Sudan, never mind that there were 18 countries that were on the, the, pla the, the, the planning committee. Um, so this will be, I think, one of the lines of attack against the fact that Afri the Africa group, as well as the G77, has been very, very strong throughout these negotiations. And we talked about it before, about how the Africa— uh, the African group negotiating bloc walked out um, of the negotiations in in Barcelona. Uh, so you know when you start to when you start to lose political ground, you start to to to, to take other lines of attack, and this is certainly going to be one of them. The other one is to claim that there's no big deal about this text; everyone knew about it. That's also not true. I interviewed uh, Bernadita Smuller, who's um, from the Philippines and is uh, really the chief negotiator for the G77. She said that this was the first time that she had heard of the text was when she read about it in The Guardian. And she also said that she's been part of these negotiations since 1988 and that she's never seen anything like this. So this is quite unprecedented. And these attempts to downplay it are, once again, you know, political lines, because they got caught. President Obama will be getting the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo tomorrow. Um, he will be addressing the escalation of war in Afghanistan, receiving the Peace Prize as he um, announces uh, the escalation of war. Naomi Klein, uh, your response to this and how uh, the United States uh, fits into this Danish text and President Obama coming here next week, agreeing to come at the end, not at the beginning. Well, you know, on the one hand, it's encouraging that he's coming at the end. Um, on the other hand, we have to understand how politics works. And, and, and I think probably this text, the existence of this text, has something to do with why Obama agreed to come to the end. I mean, most people here um, have, have observed that Obama wouldn't come unless they had, there had been some sort of a guarantee of an outcome that would have been acceptable to the United States. And clearly, they thought this Danish text was going to uh, uh, be adopted. Um, so, but, you know, if we think about Afghanistan, even, you know, coming back to the headlines that you read earlier about Zelaya, um, you know, one year into the Obama administration, I think that we're seeing on so many of the key issues that we really believed there would be change or we, we or, or, or where change was promised, that there was a new era of relationships with Latin America, um, that, that there was going to be a, a much less aggressive stand uh, um, uh, when it comes to, to the military, um, the financial sector, and now climate change. We're seeing some very, very, a series of very profound betrayals. And this is one piece of it, but a major piece of it. Martin Kaur, on that same issue. I think that um, the U.S. has a positive role to play in the climate negotiations, which it has yet to play, by 
allowing those countries who are in the Kyoto Protocol, and that's all the developed countries except the U.S., to remain there and to take their commitments there and to take high commitments there to reduce their emissions by at least 40 percent. And the United States, even if it does not want to join the protocol for whatever reason, can take a similar commitment inside the convention, because the U.S. is a member of that convention, and do a similar uh, commitment, do a similar cut. Now, the reverse is happening, as we have seen in the Danish text, that uh, those developed countries in the, in the, in the Kyoto Protocol with, with high commitments are on the verge of jumping ship to join the United States, where the U.S. is not willing to commit to an international treaty at the moment and is giving a very low commitment figure of reducing its emissions by about 4 percent between 1990 and 2020, when the sign says that we have to do it by 